to go um, and um, talked with a group about the research that I'd, I've been doing on French families, French communities, French organizations um, that have been involved in keeping the French flame alive. Um, you all may know, you may have French family yourselves. Um, the French have been active and alive in this part of the world for over 400 years. And um, I became interested in, in local French communities when I got the job at, at Smith College 20 years ago um, and had access to living French cultures um, up in Montreal I knew about. But what I discovered in my travels around the Pioneer Valley was that there were people here that speak French. And um, you could hear them speaking French on the street in Northampton, in Chicopee, in East Hampton, and other places. And um, it took me back to a part of my upbringing, a part of my childhood that I'll, I'll mention a little later as well. And so it's been really interesting to, to come back to a subject of interest, sort of intellectually and academically, but also something that's a part of my, my own family history in, in many ways. Um, so um, I'll tell you a little bit about why I, I, I wrote the book. I'll tell you, maybe I'll, I'll read a section um, before opening things up to questions and, and conversation. If, um, so that's what I, I thought I'd do. Um, I think the main objective for me was inserting uh, Franco-Americans as people of French-Canadian descent, self-identify, call themselves, in addition to French and French-Canadian, other terms, for the last um, 120 years, um, to insert Fr those French-speaking people, those Franco-Americans, into the larger story of the French-speaking world. Um, and I thought it important because sometimes people here in Chicopee or sometimes people here in Holyoke, people who grow up in Holyoke, may not consider themselves Francophone or French-speaking or even Franco-American necessarily today. Um, but they are part of this greater French-speaking world that spans North America and, and other continents as well for, for lots of reasons, uh, historical reasons. Um, there are 275 million Francophones in the world today, uh, according to the organization, uh, well, it's in French, it's the Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, the International Francophone Organization. 20 million Americans, uh, Franco-Americans, I'm sorry, two mil 20 million Americans of French and Franco Francophone descent live in North America, not just in Canada, but also in the United States and, and throughout the Americas, actually, as well. Um, and so um, what I discovered in doing the research uh, that I did was that people were actively talking about themselves as French speakers wanting to be recognized as a part of this French-speaking world um, that you can see a lot more clearly on, on, a, on a different map of, of the world. Um, there's some colonial maps and, and maps from the Organization of International Francophonie that, that show French presence um, in different parts of the world, in, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in, um, in, the, in Oceania, or Oceania is maybe called in English. Um, sort of the region around uh, Australia, um, there are French speakers. We don't often see these French speakers here in New England. Uh, we don't see them on the map and um, for, for many reasons. Um, and I, I thought it important to try to put them on the map. Um, and I saw evidence um, underscoring why they should be on the map people who were involved in Franco-American Franco and Francophone cultural activities, who were organizing socially and culturally, um, wanted to be included. They spoke French. They wrote in French, not only um, novels and, and essays, but also newspapers. We, we've got, there's a whole history of, of French journalism in, in New England. Um, that one can discover here at the, 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 the library up in the, the history room. And so th this history the, has been one that, that Franco-Americans have shared amongst themselves but hasn't been known as, as 
as well outside of, of the, the Franco-American community. And so um, I wanted to see if I, I could do my own small part in, in, in putting Franco-Americans on the, the, Frank speech, the, the map of the French-speaking world. Um, and so um, that's what I, I set out to do. Um, the, the end result is, is the book and some other writings that I've done. Um, I was very struck, again, by the, the fact that people of French-Canadian descent wanted to be included. They wrote about who they were uh, in the press, in literature, um, in, their, um, in the archives of their, their cultural organizations. It's pretty clear that they felt as if they were a part of this, a part of this world. Um, are there any Franco-Americans here? How, how, do you, how would you define Franco-American, if I can ask? How would you? Because I've got the historical definitions. I've got the definitions you can find in, in newspapers, like La Justice from, from Holyoke and other newspapers, um, from literature. Um, well, I want to say I know I have family roots that come from France through Canada. Mm -hmm. In the 1600s is when they migrated. Yeah. Um, any other Franco-Americans and definitions of what it, what being a Franco-American? They have some roots back to either Quebec or France. Yeah. Um, for uh, for maybe the organizers of act, of community groups, for the elites in Franco-American communities, for the clergy, for instance. Um, being Franco-American meant that you were French-speaking to some degree, um, very fluent for many up through the 1980s, 90s, 2000s, including through today. Um, so French language practice, Franco-American or French-Canadian cultural traditions, um, maybe expressed at Christmas time or at, at Easter. And, and also religious faith, Catholic um, religious faith. Those, were the, those have often been um, asserted as the defining pillars of Franco-American identity, language, faith, cultural traditions. And the Huguenot type, was that excluded? For a long time, yes. Um, when the French came over in the 16th and 17th century, um, only Catholics were welcome at first. Many, many Huguenots came. Many French Protestants did end up coming. Um, it was a different immigration. Um, I don't think of it as Canadian. I think of it as... Yeah, th this was French. I, yeah. I guess I think of Huguenot, Huguenot immigration as coming to the... joining with the English immigrants and avoiding Canada, maybe. There, there are Huguenots that, that did come to, 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 to North America. Um, the, 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 the other stories of, of immigration I know less about. Um, but it's, it's, it's a smaller part. Legally, they were not encouraged or allowed to come, for, at least for a, a period of time. We, we do know that people did end up coming um, in some of that initial 17th century migration. There was also um, a real hesitation on the part of the French monarchy to uh, promote um, migration. People didn't want to promote um, this new France in America at the expense of, of Europe and at the expense of, the, um, the, uh, at the expense of France, for instance. And so there was only a small level of, of immigration. The, the French story of migration is, is a small one in numbers compared to other immigrant groups. But they are significant. Um, people came and settled. People left for various reasons. People then, in a second leg of, of, of migration, people came down from Canada, and a, and a million people approximately came down from Quebec and settled uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries between 18, 1840 and, and 1930 about it. Those, those migratory currents came to a halt during the, the Great Depression. Um, but. Um, how did we get onto that? <laughs> oh, who were Frank, yeah, who is Franco-American? <laughs> Definitions of Franco-Americanness. And um, can you still be Franco-American today if you don't speak French? If you don't necessarily go regularly to mass, or if you 
don't follow cultural traditions the way your family may have or, or may not have? Um, these are all questions that, that maybe younger persons and older people talk about today. Um, but it, it was interesting to, to learn that um, people began to self-identify as Franco-American beginning in the 1890s, 1900s, and you can see it in the press, you can see it in literature. Um, it referred specifically to people coming from Canada, from Quebec and settling. Um, I use Franco-American to talk about people of French descent throughout the United States and North America because of the similarities of the French experience here. Um, I was really struck by um, how similar they are, how French communities in South Louisiana um, who grew up speaking French, who sometimes learned or were discouraged from speaking French. Legally, they were not allowed, they were not um, supposed to speak French. And, and this is similar to what French Canadians experienced uh, in, in New England. Um, there were laws you know, promoting the use of, of English um, and, and um, discouraging use of, usage of French in communities. And so families decided at times not to, to teach French, not to, can, not to pass on that linguistic heritage to, to family members. And it's, a, it's a, at times a, a, a difficult subject today amongst families and generations and, and French speakers and English speakers. And um, I've, I've heard stories um, in, in talking with people in the area about this. Um, many families have differing relationships to the language, to the culture, to the, to the religion, I suppose, as well. And, and so what does that mean uh, today? Uh, in terms of, of being a Franco-American and self-identifying as a Franco-American. Um, again, the, the similarities are striking, and, and so I use the term as a way of, of talking about um, being French, recognizing you, oneself as French in America. For many, those are two mutually exclusive sort of ways of identifying. How can one be both French and American? And, uh, and I think the people who I learned about, the people I spoke with, define how they saw themselves. The Franco-Americans identified not as French, but not as American either necessarily, although they became increasingly assimilated, but Franco-American. Uh, American, but with this distinct French experience um, that continues to, um, to um, be visible today. Are you Franco-American if you grow up still calling your grandparents Mémé and Mémère or Mémé or, uh, and Pépère, and, which you can hear in many communities, many Franco-American communities in New England, here in, Massachusetts, in Western Massachusetts, in Maine as well, um, in New Hampshire. Um, is, is that an, an, a, an identifying mark to distinguish um, a, a particular group of Americans. You know, we all come from some other place in, in lots of ways, and yet we share a lot as well. And so, um, in the, the book, I devote six chapters to um, studying the history of this French migration, this French settlement, and this French perpetuation of tradition, language, culture, um, um, I look at um, the groups, again, that have become, been active in doing this, particularly the women's groups that have been, actu that have been active in, in perpetuating um, Franco-American traditions. Um, there is a wide body of literature, literature of written in French, written in English, written in f Franglais <laughs> as well, um, really a, 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 a a mix uh, that's, that's very um, purposefully done of, of, both, la of both languages. Um, a literature that ranges from Quebec down into New England, um, down the Mississippi Valley into Louisiana. There is a literature that um, gives some sense to this identity that, exert, that exerts this, that, that defines this this identity of what it means to be to French, to be French and American, and so that's that's the subject of a chapter. Um, the the French the French language press is a tremendously rich source of information 
for people who are interested in learning more about their families, learning more about the Franco-American tradition. Um, Holyoke was a center of French journalism for a long time. There were 20, 25 papers that, that, um, that were founded in French, that were written. La Justice, and I'll show you a copy of that in just a second, um, was, the, was a highly respected French language newspaper for more than a half century, between 1904 and 1964, um, with a, a very well-respected uh, editor-in-chief um, who was one of the prominent um, uh, Franco-American intellectual, um, I guess, sources of inspiration uh, leader. He was a leader in the community, Joseph Lucier. He was the... the um, the founder, uh, I'm sorry, one of the, not the founder, but one of the, he, he bought the paper soon after it was founded in 1904. He was the editor from, from 1999 through 1940, just until the beginning of the Second World, World War. And then an, an, a, a, new, a, a new, younger man took over, uh, second generation Franco-American, uh, that was his, he was, uh, his, uh, he was the editor for just a short time before it was um, run by another Franco-American who was maybe a little less familiar with the language and became increasingly difficult for second, third generation uh, Franco-Americans to publish a French language newspaper entirely in French. Um, and, but, but La Justice uh, is, is an archive, it's an important source of information about the French-speaking community that wanted to live in French in America and be, be both American and French and that asserted, this, that, that, that asserted this in no uncertain terms, particularly during wartime. The American government was very concerned at different times about uh, foreigners and about people who spoke different languages. Of course, we know, we know what the current context um, but we see in the Franco-American press efforts to underscore that, yes, we're French, yes, we, um, we speak French, but we are American. Um, and at different times, for instance, on the 4th of July, you'll see um, the, the American flag, you'll see different sort of symbols used to indicate that, that communities consider it okay to be um, both French and American. And that duality is not a problem. It's not um, dangerous in any way. Yep. Well, I think well, there, there also seems to have been an opposing force to that, at least in my family. There was mm. a lot of pressure to become American. And like my great grandmother and great grandfather spoke only French, but they really pushed the English on their children. My grandfather. They learned both languages, but there was certainly a, um, a diminishment of the French as it came down the generation. My father grew up learning both languages, but I did not. Yeah, so, I mean, th this is the American story, right, isn't it? Um, right, and, but and it was all about, you know, we live in America, we gotta learn how to live here. Right. They say sometimes uh, there, there have been books written about the, shirt, the third generation that's a little more detached from the language, but also very interested in coming back and learning. And, um, and I studied French for nine years because yep. it was my family. You yep. know? Yeah. yeah. One of the things that I talk about in, in the book, um, you can see at the grassroots level, people coming back to their language and culture, wanting to reconnect through language, mm -hmm. um, through lost language sometimes. And, um, because an, an important part of identity is tied up in language, but I, I don't think it's entirely linguistic. There, there are parts of, our, of who we are that are expressed in other ways through food and, and religious practice and other things. Um, but it, it's been interesting to see, again, throughout the various pockets of, of Franco-America, language tables, sort of people getting together over food, um, talking, finding a place where it's okay to speak French as they learned it or as they heard it as children, even if they haven't spoken um, since they were kids. If it's been one, two, three decades since they've spoken much French, people in Maine, people in Louisiana, people here in, in Massachusetts, I, there, there are no, I know of French tables in Northampton. I, I don't know if there are things going on here in South Hadley or Chicopee or, or other places. Um, there are also 
other settings where people can get together. I know in Chicopee, for instance, to speak French and hear French spoken. But um, people have organized themselves in order to have that something that was a part of their, their, their upbringing or their childhood reintroduced. Um, and it, it varies from person to person and family to family. Um, the school was often important. And um, you mentioned people going to school in French and in English. And, and that was the tradition for a long time. Um, you went to school for half the day in French. You, you went for school. You know, the, the second half of the day was in English. Um, there's a school in Northampton where this was the case through the, well, the school existed through, through the, was around until the 1960s and 70s, and then it was torn down, and there was a monument in Northampton that I would take students to. I would show them, this is the school where people here in Northampton went to study French. If they were, um, this was the parish school where people traditionally um, learned their various subjects in French for half the day and English for half the day. Unfortunately, that, that school is no longer there. Um, it was, uh, as, 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 as parishes have dwindled, um, churches have been sold and renamed, and a part of that history is, 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 dis is disappearing rapidly, which is, I think, really unfortunate. Um, but um, it's been interesting to see people wanting to, 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 to um, to, to, to learn, to think, to discover or rediscover what it means to be Franco-American. For a number of years, a number of people in, the, in the, the, the documents that we have talk about losing their Frenchness and sometimes actively doing so because French culture and language um, in certain mill towns was denigrated. Um, the French sometimes were the last immigrant group to arrive, and so the first to reject. And so um, there was a certain level of, and, and this you find in other immigrant groups as well, younger people wanting to disassociate themselves or, or family members wanting their children to learn English so that they can assimilate, so that they don't have to um, undergo the scorn that maybe the older generations um, lived through. Um, again, this is something you see throughout um, North America, where French is a, a cultural heritage. Um, so I, I've, I've, I've been really, really interested in, in learning about that and, and, I guess, documenting some of it. Yeah. Um, why don't I show you a few slides of what I'm talking about, and, and then I can, we can talk some more. I can, I can read a section of the book. Yep. Have there been different cultures, different groups, different immigrations? Uh, yeah, it's here. It's set up chronologically. The, the, the map is not really clear when it's projected yeah. onto the screen. Um, but the French arrived. In 1604, the first French settlers, um, of course, there were explorers who came before that in the 16th century, but the first settlement um, uh, was, was established in 1604. And in, in what's currently Maine, what, what the, the border was very fluctuating between Maine and, and Canada at the time. But we see the French come down through, well, settle here come down through the St. Lawrence River Valley into the Great Lakes, and then, and then move on. Um, Louisiana was settled a little later. Um, Louisiana is celebrating this year, another, I guess, important reason to be here, um, the 300th anniversary of the city of, of New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans was founded in 1718. They're celebrating 300 years of French life in, in New Orleans this year, and I'll be there in November with a conference looking at, at, at that French heritage uh, in, in South Louisiana. Um, so the, the map is... Is provinces as considered at this time, names of provinces? Or what are the, the colors that were originally intended? Yeah. The, the colony was called, 
um, La Nouvelle France, New France. And it was made up of Canada, Acadia, and Louisiana. So there were three separate colonies within the, the, the French col a colony. And um, they, they had very similar administrative um, sort of governments. Um, there was a, um, what was called an intendant, someone representing France who was sort of the, the governor of the territory. Um, Louisiana was, was, was the real frontier in lots of ways, and, and colonial Louisiana was, is distinct in, in, in many ways, and the Acadian experience is distinct as well. Um, some of those Acadians who left what is now Nova Scotia and, and New Brunswick, you know, they were forcibly removed after the English won the transatlantic war for, for dominance. Um, the Acadians left. Um, some of them came down and settled. They, they came down the East Coast, settling in places in Virginia, in North Carolina, Massachusetts. There's several Acadian um, settlements in, in, in Massachusetts, and before ultimately the, the, the largest group of them settling in, in Louisiana and New Orleans. Um, so you have different groups. Yes. And the French being blue and the purple being a kind of mix with different intensities of, of control. And then I see the white of Florida being Spain. Probably yeah. The These are the different colonial powers. It, it, what, what the map illustrates, I think, uh, strategically, uh, the, the French really wanted to thwart the British from moving across. And so um, we find that um, the French settlers, the the Cours de Bois, the French bushwhackers, um, who, who, who really helped set up exploration. Lewis and Clark uh, traveled across the continent with French expeditioners, French bushwhackers. And um, so the French, along with the Indians, with the Native Americans, I should say, set up colonies and camps, really. There, there were smut, New Orleans and other places were, were really small camps with small numbers of people compared to the highly populated areas in New England. Um, but the, part of the, the strategy for colonization, part of the French strategy for colonization of, of the continent was, was keeping the English from moving further west. And so this was when the French were still vying for control here, here in North America. And so we see a, dis, a very different approach to colonization, a different approach to um, population as well, and much, much greater mixing with Native American Indian populations. Um, in Louisiana today, you have uh, Native American uh, tribes where the native language is French, Cajun French, mm -hmm. and that's a part of this colonial history, um, as part of this Franco, what, what some historians call um, not French America or Franco America, but Franco Indian America, because the Native American presence was very strong, and French Native American um, intermixing was was very uh, prevalent, uh, especially compared to what was going on in, in New England to the, the English colonies. So, so Cajun comes from Acadian, but it refers to the ones that migrated down to Louisiana. Exactly, it said. Finally got that. It's Acadia's way up there. What's that have to do with Louisiana? Now I yep. get it. Acadian and Cajun is kind of a deformation of the word Acadian. Mm -hmm. And there are other terms uh, that have been developed over the years um, to talk about that, 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 that migration, that sort of, that, that sort of mixing of populations. Um, they, there's a word that isn't very useful uh, or used today, Cadien, C-A-D-I-E-N. And it, it was a creation, sort of an attempt to, to create a word to encompass these different French-speaking communities in Louisiana. Um, so it's used sometimes by Cajuns or Cadien, um, but it, it never really caught on. Um, Creole is also a term that's used that, that really encompasses this uh, French tolerance for uh, hybridity and mixing this Franco-Indian-African um, 
sort of contact, I guess I'd say, here that was taking place in Louisiana. We see more of that uh, in Louisiana than in any other place, although, again, the French and the Native American contact and mixing was, was highly prevalent, again, Where in comparison. Where did Creole come from? Because I had, anyway, I'm interested in this etymology, but also when I saw that term on your talk poster, yeah. I hadn't thought of Creole as here. Yeah. It's, it, you don't see it used here as much. Yeah. There aren't very many Franco-Americans who identify as Creole. But when you look at the, the high levels of mixing in Quebec, there isn't, there, there, there are few families in Quebec today that don't have any Native American uh, influence or, 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 fa or blood in their families. Very true also in Franco-American families as well. Um, from the very beginning in Acadia, in Quebec, um, settlers were intermingling with Native Americans. We know this. This is, this is in the documents. Um, this is in the archives. And so Creole is, is a word that comes from Portuguese, Criolo, because the Portuguese and the Spaniards were the first, really, to begin this transatlantic um, voyage and, and passage and settlement. And so the, the, the French word comes from Spanish and, and comes from Portuguese. And Creole um, means uh, it, it can refer to language, it can refer to culture, but it's a, it's a a term that, um, it's a term that refers to the contact and the communication and the comprehension between communities of different race, religion, ethnicity, culture. Um, Creole is the bridge. So it's a word? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's the bridge that, that, um, that led different communities to connect. Um, again, Creole languages. Creole foods, Creole, you can attach Creole to, to just about anything. And today, in terms of advertising, you find Cajun and Creole attached to pizza and all sorts of things in Louisiana that has nothing to do with the French experience at all. But it, it's kind of a marketing gimmick. gimmick. Um, what does the original Portuguese word mean, Creole? Creole means from the old world, but born in the new world. Um, Great word. <laughs> and so yeah. these are communities, cultures, uh, from people could come from, from Europe, from, um, from Africa. They could also be indigenous to the US um, in some ways, but um, it, it refers to both old, old world and new world, this combination of the two. That's, that's something that, that's a part of that, the definition as well. Um, so, anything else before moving on to another slide? Yeah, I, I also want to, you said how, you know, the, the culture was vibrant here in 1964 with the newspaper. I remember Charles de Gaulle and his famous visit to Quebec, you know, the Quebec region, and, um, you know, what a controversy that caused. Um, and, of course, President Kennedy's wife was going I came of age in that time period, I'd rather it's basically 62. So didn't the French Canadian government want to foster that uh, continuation of French culture in, in the United States? When they couldn't, when they couldn't stop the, <laughs> when they couldn't stop people from coming, I'd say yes. Once, once communities became permanently settled, um, there were efforts, um, and today, through the Francophone, International Francophone Organization, their efforts from the Quebec government, the Belgian government, um, the Canadian government, to promote um, diversity, linguistic diversity in the United States, French speakers. Um, but for, for many people, when, when people were migrating from Quebec, this was a source of great pain embarrassment. and embarrassment, national embarrassment for religious and political elites in Quebec. And so there was a lot of uh, pressure to return. There was, many of the newspapers had columns of repatriation. People wanted communities to return. People dueled over this. Should communities stay here permanently? Should they return to Quebec? Uh, highly controversial um, subject for, for many. Um, 
the old, for the older guard, th this, this probably will be a term that some of you have, have, have heard, um, French cultural preservation, what was called la survivance. This was a slogan, this was a motto, this was what had to be promoted. Remaining f loyal, re re remaining um, patriotic, remaining uh, French Canadian, even though you were removed from Quebec. The, the, the fathers and mothers um, sometimes attempted to instill this, this imperative in children, keeping the, keeping the race going, keeping the language, keeping the religion. Keep, this, this was vital. This is what the newspapers like Holyoke's La Justice were, were promoting in, in columns. How do you remain loyal to your French-Canadian heritage, especially when you're, you're outside its borders? And so younger generations struggled with this. They struggled with the church. They struggled with the language. They struggled with their attachment to the traditions. If they wanted to play baseball or if they wanted to take on other kinds of sort of pastimes that, that kids growing up in, in Holyoke and Springfield were doing, yet the church may, or their elders may have frowned on. Um, these are things that, that families were probably discussing and debating, and how do you negotiate this? How do you be French and American? In what degree? Um, what, to what degree had, do you have to preserve that Frenchness in order for it to remain vital? Um, Again, I, 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 I've, I think I, I've seen evidence of this being defined very differently for different individuals um, and families really struggling with this. So, and, and making individual choices about whether to teach French or not. These, these are choices that individuals had to make. Sometimes the choice was not there. Sometimes um, for, for economic or social reasons, people it was clear what, what needed to be done to them. Um, so we, we can come back to this if, if, if uh, we'd like to. Um, this is the, the picture that I, that I mentioned in the, in the beginning uh, as I was talking with a few of you. Um, this is the, the first illustration in the book. It's something I discovered here in Holyoke. Um, it was most recently on you could see it on the facade of the building on the corner of Appleton and, and Race Streets. Um, what I discovered, like yep, this was at the warehouse, exactly. It's still, as far as I know, is it still there? I haven't been there in the last year. I was there last, last. Yep, um, that's where I discovered it during the St. Patrick's Day race <laughs> here in Holyoke about 10 years ago. I went back and, and, and took a picture. I, I've been back a, a bunch of times, and I, I was there last summer just to, I wanted to see if it was still there. And I, I think I, was half of, is half of it there? I, oh. oh no. it, it seems so symbolic in so many ways. Um, <laughs> honestly, it, it um, this was intact at one point, this yep. bilingual monument um, inscribed um, physically built into a building. What I, what I learned in La Justice, in my reading in, in La Justice in the 1910s, um, primarily, also in the 1920s, um, this was a space, this, the, the Monument National was where people gathered for important events, for sporting events, for cultural events, for theater. Holyoke was a big arts town, artsy town in the 1910s and 1920s, people gathered for poetry readings to watch theater in French. These were people, French speakers, who wanted to see um, um, French, the French arts um, in their native language. And so um, this was a space where, where they, could, they could see that. This was a space where, where the, the biggest stars, the, the art stars, but also the sports stars um, came. Wrestling was a huge uh, sport. And, and feats of, not just wrestling, but feats of strength. Uh, Louis Cyr, you, some of you may know, there was a film, it was a, it was a 2013 blockbuster in Quebec about the, the strongest man in the world in the late 19th, late 19th century, early 20th century, Louis Cyr, who spent um, a good bit of time in a, in a New England mill town in Lowell. Um, but he, he and others came to, to demonstrate their strength 
at the Monument National. No, it, it, there's an old, yeah, it was taken down, but someone who, who was here, who I met in 2015, sent me a picture of what I, what I would guess was this plaque on the building on the corner of Race and Appleton in the 1950s, maybe. I don't know what year it came down. Was it an exhibition hall? Yes. Oh, it was right there um, between Race and the canal. Can I share my oh, oh, sure. Yep. Oh my goodness. He's got it. <laughs> well, that was the building and they tore it and it, it bordered the canal. It, no, it, it was on the corner of Race and Appleton and it burned down. It, it was the home of Kelly's Lobster House at one time, which oh, was a yeah. kind of a prominent Hoyoke restaurant. Oh, and I believe it, that would have been in the early 80s when that building came down by fire. But, but oh. is there a vacant lot? It's a vacant lot. It's between the Cubit building where the Hoyle uh, Community College Culinary Arts Program is and oh, the steam yeah. building. Okay. Oh, it's, it's a an empty lot building. right on that corner. Yeah. And it was used for just exhibits and I mean, how, how did it make it, it, it like economic? One of the many fires of polio. So where? In that time, but I don't know how so it Oh, so it's just the, the later. You, you can't actually see the. No, that was okay. The building on Race and Apple. Okay. To, yep. To watch spectacles. <coughs> a lot of the clubs in Holyoke have their own buildings. So they use them for meetings, they use them for these public events for entertainment. Yeah. So it, I, I thought it, in, I, I wanted to include this, and, and I, it, it just seemed right to have this be one of the, the first illustrations uh, in, in the book. Um, Throughout the, the book, I, I have several monuments, um, several, um, several illustrations of, of what some call, what historians call sites of memory. Um, physical objects, statues, commemorations that, that really put that French heritage on the map or, or in this town square or on a building. And there's so many of them you can find in, in, in French ethnic, former French ethnic neighborhoods, um, what were called Le, Le Petit Canada. Um, not too many know about Little Canada's the way you know about Little Italy's and Chinatown's and other ethnic neighborhoods. Um, but in, in, um, in Holyoke, in Lewiston, Maine, in Manchester, New Hampshire, um, in Worcester, Massachusetts, and other towns, you can find these symbols. What I, what I discovered. Some of them, oh no, no, yeah. And so you have to know, you, you find out through reading from people in the newspapers and the literature. Um, quite honestly, I stumbled on some of these completely by accident, walking around the areas where French, where people of French descent grew up. Um, because there, there's no map indicating the spaces where you can find commemorations. I, from some individuals, I, might know, I may find out that there was, um, uh, a monument built to honor the people who were killed in the, the great fire of Holyoke in 1875, but th there's, nothing, there's nothing else. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really detective work, finding these things and, and, and creating the map in, in some ways. Um, but the map is disappearing as well. That, that's what's been distressing for me a little bit as a, I, I, a sort of engaged, I'm trying to, I, I'm, I have to be detached in some ways, but I, I find I, I'm, it's hard to be detached from, from this history. But the, the best way to find them is to find the churches. Yeah, yeah. Where the original church was, and you'll find the neighborhood. Yep. Right the but the churches are disappearing. Yeah, so you have to find it in the directory. Yeah. 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 Um, there, was, there was a three French churches in Hoyle. One was at the corner of it's a vacant lot up there. Yeah. This, this va which, which vacant lot? Yeah, right up there. The whole lot. Just the one? Yeah. yeah. It was the Petra's own church. It had burned in 1989. So this whole, this whole neighborhood was a French community. Right. Was it considered Le Petit Canada? Did people use that term? It, it, was, it, was, a, it was the last one of Forbes, so people wouldn't have used it. But for the other two, they did. Uh -huh. Where the precious blood was, and definitely, yeah. Blood where Mac the conception was, it definitely. Yeah. And that came down. No, that's still there. Oh, oh well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
the church was taken down. Right. The school and the convent are still there. Yeah. 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 You, you wanted to say something? No. No? Okay. <laughs> okay. I thought, I thought you yeah. had a question. So there, Yeah. I know they're still getting immigrants. Right? Yeah. But, I mean, Canada doesn't, or French Canadians don't seem to be. Well, there, there are groups oh, in, in Chicopee that, and, and Lowell that are organizing. Um, there's there's a, a woman who's organized a French cultural center. I don't know if they have a home yet, but she, she comes to all of these meetings. She was at the, 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 the talk that I gave here in 2015. I, I have her name written down. I don't remember. But she's, she's begun a, a series of, of meetings and, or, and I'm sorry if I, I, I wasn't oh, oh no. there was nothing. I just well, seem less, they seem less, yeah. less, or less visible. <clears throat> um, Perhaps it's just my perception. I wonder if one reason for that might be the fact that the French lost in the big war with England. And so there's this overarching sense that we're the underdog. And when you come here, you got to work at fitting in. you got to work at it more than other groups that have come who weren't at war with the United States. Mm -hmm. It's also what when the you know when the bishop cut so many churches there. I forget what year it was, maybe eight years ago. Sure. Two thousand nine. There, there wasn't any advocacy for, or didn't there didn't seem to be very loud advocacy. Oh my gosh, people are fighting desperately to save um, Notre Dame des Canadiens in Worcester, another old historic beautiful church, that is the the the, the wrecking ball is there right now. <laughs> People are, are hoping to save it. They tried to save Immaculate Conception. It's, a, it's super expensive. There's a beautiful old church in um, another uh, French ethnic neighborhood, Woonsocket, uh, Saint Anne maybe, um, that came down. It was impossible to continue to heat that space. It was so expensive. The, the parish had no longer been active. You know, some living parishes are still fighting. Some parishes have been dispersed as churches have been divided and sold. Um, meeting spaces have, you know, there was a group that was meeting regularly through 2009. They had French night. Did, did any of you ever go in Chicopee? Hundreds of people came from all over New England. When Church of the Nativity was sold, they no longer had a, had a meeting space. And so now they're, 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 they're soirée canadien. They're, they're sort of French Canadian nights that are organized much smaller events in, in different towns to get together to play music, to eat traditional French Canadian meat pie and pea soup, to dance, to hear music, but it's much, much smaller. This was a, a, a group that had been meeting for 10 years that um, had funding, that had political support here in the, from various politicians here in the area, and, and it, it, it died because it, they, they no longer had that space. Um, so th there are probably lots of different reasons why we know, why do we know less about the French? That, that was my, that was one of the questions for me. Um, why do we know so little about, outside of French Canadian or French Franco-American homes, why do we know so little about the French experience outside of Louisiana and Cajuns? And there's something about that Cajun, that spicy cuisine, that culture, the music that, that has um, attracted attention. We know a little bit more about that. We know about Quebec. What we don't know so much about is the French heritage here in New, New England, in the heart of New England, there is a French history. The French were participants in a part of American history, and it's important, I think. They were here, they're still here. Like other groups, no more, no more important, no less important, but they are here and, and their presence is here and, and we can find it. It's, it's, it's still visible on the map if you look for it. I want to look at I want to find it before it disappears. That, that, that's a, been a part of, of the reason why I've been looking for some of these things and a, and a part of the reason why I'm distressed in some ways that it's no longer there. Um, I wonder if there's a difference in who migrated to which areas. Have you seen like class differences or anything? Yeah. Because I mean, I'm familiar with like my family and, and other French families that I'm aware of. It was coming to work in the mills. Definitely. So, yeah. you know, there was this big emphasis on survival. That's it. You know, you got to fit in. You got to learn the English. You got to be able to work in the mill when you're 14. That's it. Yeah. You know, and 
not a lot of emphasis on the frills of life, the arts. That was maybe more middle class. Yeah. They say that um, after um, some of the first immigrants came and settled and began working in the mills, they contacted their family members and friends, sometimes told them that wages were, were there to be made. Life was better, easier here in, in Lowell and, and Holyoke and in other places. There were also recruiters that went to Canada to bring people down to work in the mills. But after some of those um, initial immigrants came, after some of the, um, the settlements were began, people needed others. We needed doctors and we needed nurses and, and we needed um, specialists and, and they needed clergy. We needed religious people to, to, to lead communities. And so there, there was definitely a middle class and so there's kind of a class divide in some ways. Some of the elites were hoping to, through culture, through art, through language, bring people up in some ways, so to speak, and, and keep French going. Um, but it, it's interesting to me to find, and this is something you find in France as well, these were working class efforts at cultural preservation. These were not elites. People wanted to just gathering, mm -hmm. um, writing poetry. Um, writing in, you know, living life. Not, not, not everyone were, were writers, and actually the writers were actually writers on this. They were re Renaissance, Renaissance men and women writing, but also working in the mills, building furniture. Um, and so um, people were not professional writers most often, although they, there were professionals uh, running the, the newspapers in, in some cases. Um, but um, is it the fact that we're talking about mostly working class people? Does that contribute to the fact that we know less about them today? Definitely. Um, that's, that's a question that I, that I ask myself, um, that we talk about when I, when I get together and talk about some of these issues. These are, these are primarily working class cultures um, and traditions. And um, this was not to some degree, an elite imposing. Alliance yeah, although the Alliance Francaise has an interesting history in Franco-America. The Alliance Francaise promoted Franco-American cultures in mill towns because it already had an infrastructure. Mm. Chat, what I, I studied the early history of the Alliance Francaise, and you can find it in the mill towns. They, um, chapters were opened and Franco-Americans, not always um, working class Franco-Americans, sometimes the, the, the people sort of Mr. and Mrs. Um, cultural sort of and social economic, you know, people who had maybe done well for themselves and their families. Um, the, the, the Alliance Francaise is a, is a bone of contention for some Franco-Americans because it was an elite institution. It's still seen today as an elite institution, but it was very involved in working class Franco-American communities. And chapters opened, um, and they were different kinds of chapters from the larger urban chapters that taught French, that, um, that promoted a kind of cultural elitism. But um, you, you see, Northampton has a Franco-American history. Northampton has a Franco-American journalistic past and heritage. Northampton had Franco-American schools and organizations. Um, these were mostly working class people. Again, the, the, the people running the institutions were sometimes members of the elite, and, and that's where you get the, some of the, the contention, but. Um, yeah. um, in oil, I think the Alliance Francaise was the building this direction. It's now a Jewish synagogue. How do you know that? I, I, tried to find, I tried to find where the Alliance Francaise was in, in Northampton, and I, I couldn't find it. Well, I went the directories. The directories? Yeah. That, it's so, when you, <laughs> there, in the archives, so little has been saved. And, and there, you can find some things, and I, I've got some information, and I was able to sort of go from one bit of information to the next. Um, there, there, there have now been a couple of historical pieces written on the, the early Alliance Francaise, but it was, it was really a decentralized French institution that allowed French speakers independently to promote their culture. And so you had Franco-Americans running these French institutions in order to sort of 
preserve their, their, their own tradition, and that was okay. This is a very Parisian, very elite institution that at the same time has this grassroots network of, of chapters in, in places like Holyoke. I, I, wow, that's amazing that we, we know for a fact that, there, that the Holyoke the, the was right there. Yeah. Wow. I was trying to give it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, Amherst had a Amherst had a um, an Alliance Francaise. Northampton had one. North Adams and Williamstown. Massachusetts had more Alliance Francaise than any other state. And now there's just one, and it's in Boston, and it's very high culture, wow. very. But. Um, It's, it's not surprising. These were often just small chapters. Um, but there, there was also, and this is also a bone of, con or a subject of some tension, um, the American International College in Springfield, pro founded by Protestant missionaries. And so there was a whole question of proselytizing. Proselytizing Catholics. That was so. They're 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 one of the first institutions to offer education to women. But for Franco Americans in the Catholic tradition, this was because they were Protestant and because they may have been attempting to convert people to Protestant faith. Or I, I, where, uh, hmm, where they, I, I believe Quebec, but I, I could be wrong. I, I don't believe, I think people were coming from France and Quebec, so it, I, it, it, for, for the, the different sisters and brothers that were attached to parishes and churches, mostly Quebec, but, but sometimes France. And, and I, I'm not sure in this individual case, but um, I, I learned, in learning more about American International College, um, that, that this was a, at its founding a Protestant institution. When so, was it founded? Eight, in the 1880s. Um, again, this was an, again, for, for working class people, you find these institutions of higher learning helping people to maybe ascend the social and economic ladder. Um, in Louisiana, you have the, uh, the University of, of Louisiana Lafayette, which was founded by Acadians for working class Acadians to promote education, to give them an opportunity to um, make a better life for themselves and their families. Um, and so it's interesting, there, there's so many schools in New England um, that, are, that, are, that were founded to educate Franco-Americans specifically, Assumption College in Worcester, but that are now uh, uh, educating other immigrant groups. Um, so um, it's interesting, there are all kinds of interesting tensions and parallels and uh, I guess, Contrasts, I guess, when you look at the French experience in, in, in New England. Um, I know we're after 11. I, I, I can just show you a couple of images if, if people still have time um, before we, we wrap things up. Um, I, I had a wonderful chance to spend time with the Franco American, the Franco -American Women's Association, uh, Les Dames Franco Américaines, l'Association des Dames Franco Américaines in French, founded in 1953. They, they let me sit in on their meetings and, and just observe. Um, what it means to be Franco-American today. I, they, they, they told me sort of jokingly that I'd, I'd become their mascot. <laughs> <laughs> I was always there, sort of just listening. And they still gather every Thursday, the third Thursday of every month um, in Chicopee. Um, some of their formal activities, the induction of new members, um, death, uh, 
when, when, dead, when members die, the funerals are, are held in French. These, these groups are important for preserving something of the French tradition. People know that um, they'll be able to hear French, they'll be able to um, participate in, 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 in French traditions when they go there. French and English is spoken. Um, people sometimes go between languages. They're French tables and, la and English tables. It was amazing to, to watch people sort of code switch, go between the languages. Um, people who told me they did not speak the language at all, but could instinctively begin speaking French. Hmm. When they felt the need to or when they wanted to, they could sing in French. Songs, prayers came back in French. There is something still deeply French about people who may think, consider them, themselves to be um, entirely English speaking. Um, so um, they've been a great source of inspiration and I, I talk about them in the, in the group. Women have been preserving French traditions for um, a long time. Um, and, and if we still have record of, of some of the French activities in New England. It's through the, the organizational work of, of women. Um, this is, I think this is the, we, I was talking with Allison about uh, the, 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 the French school. This is one of the last remaining schools that still to some degree teaches French, not as a foreign language, but as a heritage language to kids and to boys and girls whose grandparents may have spoken French in the home. Um, there's a Franco-American teacher who spends time each day talking and teaching with them in French. And so um, this is the old, it's St. George's School in Chicopee. Um, people thought that it could have been fused with other schools and maybe it could have been a, a larger, more prominent French school today. Um, but uh, there are all kinds of people have donated uh, money to pr pr promote and to continue the teaching of French in, in, in the area through, through this school often. Um, this is uh, a, an example of, of the French newspaper of Holyoke and of what were often French pride celebrations um, around St. John the, da the Baptist Day. So late June every year, the French community would gather in Springfield um, to say that we that are. Day, as opposed to other, is that more connected with French Canadians than it's, say Bastille? Yeah. Bastille Day today is sometimes um, celebrated in Franco-American communities. Um, it was really started in the 80s by French as a marketing tool. Um, but to, it's much more sort of prevalent today at, in the 19... 20s, 30s, um, no one celebrated, that I, I've seen no record of any Bastille Day celebrations in Franco-American communities before the 80s, really. Um, and so um, St. John the Baptist Day is considered the, f it's, it's Quebec's national holiday. Uh, okay. So Franco-Americans have adopted a, that holiday as a, a day to affirm publicly their, their French connection, their French Canadian heritage. Is that the 22nd or 23rd? It's usually the 24th. Oh, the 24th. Yeah. Is it supposed to be 23rd or 24th, like a religious one, 23rd, and the civil one, 24th? Yeah. Lowell has a, a week-long celebration that, where they celebrate. And um, I, I spent uh, some time in Lowell talking with people, reading Lowell's newspaper, um, learning about experience of groups in, in Lowell. Um, and they're one of the last groups sort of meeting regularly to, to publicly, it, they get in front of City Hall. Every ethnic group seems to have its day. And so the Franco-American day on June 24th, often sometimes the 23rd, the French get to talk about what it means to be French. The mayor makes a, a public declaration. City council members come and talk, former mayors talk about what it means to be French and what it meant historically in the town of Lowell. Um, so, 
Wow. Something that I know it's probably a topic for another book. I don't <laughs> any other ethnic group. But I mean, how, you know, we who are of us later generations, how we deal with that, you know, aspects of the, of the mixed heritage and so on. It's, a, it's another complex subject. Yeah. It and just seems to me that, you know, we all lose if we don't keep each one. You know, uh, it's, there's nothing, that's, it's not about who's the winner. Well, there, there, was a, there was sometimes pressure to marry within the ethnic group. Some families, there were, there were intermarriages that were probably viewed with far more favor as time went on. But a lot of, lot of marriage within groups, sometimes that may be why French was continued. If people married, say, with someone who happened to be Polish or Irish, maybe French wasn't shared as much within the family. It depends so much on the family, individually, I, from what I gather. But the French and Irish were often seen as rivals in places like Holyoke and, and um, because of the relationship. It, but you know, it, they, people perhaps could have found camaraderie in the fact that the Irish and the French had suffered from discrimination in lots of ways historically. Um, well, yep. Yeah, but through the fact of the Irish-French connection from an Irish from an Ireland. Um, well, well, St. Patrick's Day is always celebrated in Montreal. You know, it's been there. I think there's such an Irish immigration in Quebec too. But Anglo Montreal is very separate from French Montreal, and the French ethnic celebrations, for instance, on Jul on June June twenty fourth. This is French Canadian sort of Pride Day, um, but Canada has has a. I, I think, they're, they're Canada similarly in, in similar ways to the U.S. has an immigrant history. Different. There's a much more harmonious sort of uh, sense of connection between immigrant groups in some ways in, in Canada than here. I, I don't know if that reflects at all what you're talking about here in Holyoke, for instance, and other places. The fact that Sometimes the, the religious authority was English speaking and Irish was a bone of contention for parishioners who were French speaking and wanted to have mass in French. And so um, people requested having French priests be sent down, <coughs> be educated. Many, Father Lafleur from Chicopee went up to Canada to, to get his education. Well, actually, he's from Quebec. He's from Chicopee. I think he went to seminary in Quebec, if I remember correctly. He was a religious authority, a French-speaking priest in, in, in the area for a long time. There are far fewer French-speaking priests now than there were. Some are coming from other French-speaking areas. Um, but uh, long story, the Irish-French connection, tension, um, how the Irish and the French voted was also uh, you know, a point. Some people say the French voted one way because the Irish voted another way. And so um, you, know, you, could get in, you could go on and on. Okay, so um, here's the, the site of the, of the former French school that I used to take students to in Northampton. I can no longer do so because the monument has been moved. Oh, no. The plaque was taken off. I, I, I don't understand. People were, students were just amazed to learn that French was spoken. We used to walk through the old French neighborhood. I'd, I met with some people at, at Sacred Heart Church and they would speak to students in French. They, they would, the students would try to speak in French. The parishioners would try to speak in French. <laughs> it was a nice meeting. We'd, we'd, we'd talk about the school where half the day was spent in French, half the day in English. Do you know why it was uh, Well, the church was bought. And so for the, a new history to be written for this new parish, I think it's um, it's Saint Anne Seton, Saint Anne, uh, I, and I I don't know if I had, I had heard it. I don't know the the ethnic nature of this new parish, but um, it seems to me that if there's a large space in front of the church that the the, the his, I, I'm not sure, and I, I don't I don't know the history of, of this new church, but I, I I would have liked for the old history to have been left. Because now there's nothing at all indicating this, this, this had been a French church. What street is that? This is right on King Street uh, on, in Northampton. 
Saint, Saint, it's St. Anne Seton now. Um, uh, it's the corner of, uh, it's very close to the corner of King and, and Pleasant and Main Street. And uh, it's, there, there's a bank, there's across the street, there's a subway. Um, and the, the stone, if you, I, I tried to find the stone, it's behind the church and the plaque has been removed. Um, I, to me, that, that hist it's historically disrespectful. I, I, I understand in, in some ways that maybe a new page wants to be written. This new church wants to start afresh, but. Yeah. Well, maybe they've got plans to put it somewhere else. Let's hope that's the case. Well, wouldn't the plaque have been kept? And it, it, it could have just, they could have, they could have even placed it a little further away. There's still the statue. There's still, there's the statue there that was there with the original church. What was the plaque made of? Ah. Looks like brass. Right. So there's a lot of metal disappearing. Uh, I had to have a plaque for my mother replaced three times. It could have been and stolen, it's you think? In with like the draws with kind of resin plaques now. Ah. Oh. metal plaques. So maybe it was removed and then it was stolen. So oh. Well, that's even a little better. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. At least historically, yeah. That, yes. but yeah. <laughs> That's an actual crime instead of a virtual. Yeah. Right here, they just want to be. But even more ignorant. Yeah. Time for some questions. Definitely, and maybe I'll just end on on one comment. Um, and again, it's a part of this sort of rewriting disappearance of history. It's a part of the French story, the the hidden, obscure, dispersed nature of the French experience in the U.S. Um, for for many, the the best known and sometimes unknown representative of, of Franco-American heritage is Jack Kerouac. Huh. He is a, he's a Lowell boy of French-Canadian descent. He wrote in French. Now Quebec, Quebec publishing houses, publishing houses are publishing some of his old stuff in French. Wow. Um, he had an old site, a burial site on, I found his burial uh, plaque. Um, I hope that's still there. Um, well, I know it's been changed, um, but this, I, I guess, officially, it, had, it was sit on the ground, and it was a site of pilgrimage for people who had read On the Road. But people, Jack Kerouac had this French past. Um, you know, he's, he's this sort of American hipster guy that, that sort of defines what it meant to be on the road, but he was French. He wrote about this from a French perspective. In 2014, in 2014, his burial site was renewed because so many, so many people come to see it. And so his new site um, um, has nothing, no trace of his French heritage. The old site had Petit Jean written onto it, which was his nickname. And it comes from Petit Jean. This is a nickname that you can find throughout French America, Louisiana, New England. It's a diminutive, you know, Little John, Little Pete. And, and pe family members are known as T, T Pierre, T something. T, and uh, T apostrophe T I T. It's sometimes T I, okay. or sometimes you see, yeah T I T I. Sometimes you see the hyphen, sometimes not Jean or, or other names. And so that was that at least was something on on the old plaque. The 2014 plaque says, "The road is forever," or something like that. Again, it's it's it's. it's it, to his, yeah, and it's again, focusing on this sort of American story, but that ignores his French past. And, and we're learning more and more about his French past and his French writing. And is he buried in Lowell? Yeah, yeah, this is right in Lowell, in one of the many Catholic cemeteries in, in Lowell. Um, so, um, but it, it, it's again sort of emblematic of this French experience, this French history within in the history of the United States that that, that I, I find interesting. I should say it, it's interesting for me because I grew up around it. My family moved to, to central Maine uh, when I was a kid, and so I went to high school with Lavertiers and Pelletiers, <laughs> and um, we became interested in this French experience that we, know, we knew very little about, my sister and I and, and my mom. And so it's been interesting as a teacher to come back to this French that I grew up with in lots of ways and, and to recognize its 
authenticity this is. Today we recognize the many varieties of French as spoken in France, Quebec, uh, Haiti, wherever, Senegal, Morocco. These are varieties of French. It is French that is being spoken. Sometimes people will express amazement that their French is understood when they go to France, when veterans went to France and spoke and translated during the war. They got a sense of pride out of that, but also surprise in learning that their French was understood by Parisians. And <laughs> what is not French is not clear. <laughs> yep. Um, so um, I'll, I'll end there. I'll, 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 I'd love to talk with you more. I, I know we've probably gone over the allotted hour or so that we've had. Um, sure. Women's clubs were treated rather dismissively, but in this century, there's been some revisionist <laughs> history on that, and I wondered if you Same know, thing in yeah, <laughs> women. about the, the function of women's clubs for the women themselves, and then yeah. the functions that they played in the larger society. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't compared, I didn't do it a comparative analysis in this case, um, but it would be really interesting. Um, so I, I don't know as much about the women's groups in other ethnic traditions mm -hmm. or in mainstream Anglo-American traditions. Um, but women were, were excluded from the social and cultural groups for Franco-American men that, that developed, the Beaver Clubs and the, um, the Lafayette Clubs that, that established themselves in various communities. And so um, from the early 1900s on, women founded their own clubs. Later on, women were invited to join some of the traditional men's clubs, and, and some of them did. But as one woman in Lowell said to me that, why would they do that? They were more expensive also. <laughs> membership, membership was, was, the membership fees were more, and, and there were fewer men um, in, in some of the groups. Um, there was also some, some hostility, I guess, to the fact that women were invited when these groups were barely surviving, and groups needed membership. <laughs> Needed, you know, membership numbers needed to be boosted. This is, I'm only speaking about a couple of, of groups that, I, that I've actively talked about, but um, this was what, this was some of the, I guess some of the, the pushback I, I, I heard. Um, oh, that's, so, okay. <laughs> that's why I thought, I keep thinking you have got questions. <laughs> yeah, no, no. nationalist pride tends to be mapped onto skin color really closely. And then, so, so are you, you seem to be saying that within this Francophone culture, that's not the case, that identity is more of the language and culture. And I just wondered, have that been horrible? Um, has that persisted? And also, what it, have you been able to investigate what it was like for people with that perspective? to be living in, in a U.S. culture that's categorizing people yeah. rigidly uh, it's by very, color. Very different. Um, the French tradition is to define the nation totally apart from race and ethnicity. The French are French um, because they choose to be French. Um, and, and the French identity, French national identity is very tied up in the revolution and in the formation, the opening of French culture to people who had been excluded. This is the whole history, class history of, of the monarchy um, and the, the church really also, um, the Catholic church possessing virtually all of the wealth in France. And the revolution was about creating a, a kind of citizenship that was open to all. And so today, people still want Frenchness to be about the nation to be about sharing this common conception of what, of this common set of laws, a common set of experiences, maybe a common language. The, the French, or French national identity is very tied to language in some ways, although French scholars have sometimes pointed out 
to, have sometimes pointed out to me that maybe American identity is more tied to language than we know, and maybe we see that more today with sometimes English only mm -hmm. um, efforts. And um, that, that, but we, that was you know that was the case even in the 1920s and 30s when people were coming from from Ireland or Italy or other places that there was a there was a fear of, of, of difference and, and sometimes of linguistic difference. Um, it's harder today, I'd say, for the French to maintain that tradition of identi identification, national identification outside of race and ethnicity. France is much more diverse. Um, France, France has a difficult colonial and, and complicated colonial history in, in Africa, um, particularly North Africa and West Africa. And um, French politicians, French, French Republicans, and this is French Republicans in the, in the French sense, have wanted to keep, to, 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 to keep race outside of national identity and to avoid the identity politics that they see in the United States with different groups asserting their identity, asserting their, their right to difference based on, on skin color or, or maybe religion. Um, but um, the, the US are and the French are two different kinds of immigrant nations that have approached national identity in different ways. Um, so lots and lots of parallels, but also lots and lots of differences, I think. But the, the French tolerance for diversity and for mixing historically is very striking and very different from the, the, the Anglo-American model. And, um, and you see this also in terms of slavery and how, how the, the legal definition of slavery and the rights of slaves in Louisiana vis-a-vis -vis slavery in, 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 Anglo, in Anglo colonies. There was a, a different, you know, slavery, critics will say slavery is slavery. There were different interpretations. There were different kinds of politics around slavery in Louisiana and different ways of getting around slavery. There was far more mixing, far, this, far more rights, far more getting around laws and, right, and, and far more uh, seizing of rights um, from, from slave populations in Louisiana because of different boundaries, different kinds of contact between groups. Slaves were not punished in the same way for crimes that they were in the, in the, in the, in the the United States of America, in, in Anglo America, I guess. And so you've got these different traditions, different groupings, different experiences that are very different in Louisiana, very different in Franco America than in, in Anglo America. Yeah. I was interested, and I'm sure you know about this, but when I was reading about the colonial history of this region recently, to realize that the English settlement of New England really concentrated on sending, I mean, it wasn't as necessarily as much sending people on behalf of the government, but families went. The focus was whole family groups went, whereas the French, where people were trying to set up outposts to contain the English seizing of this continent, um, sent men to create trading posts and outposts where they weren't bringing a whole family, where mm -hmm. young military age men were creating families and therefore the alliances with the Native Americans formed much more respectfully and naturally both because they had strategic interests in containing the English because they had fewer reservations and, and racial biases maybe through contact and, and recognizing each other as people with common interests, but much more linguistic cross-learning, and that that history of sending chiefly men without families, as opposed to a more an exodus of family groups who were leaving for a variety of reasons in the New England portion, really created a different respect and intermixing and intermingling mm -hmm that created both, you know, that shaped the colonial history of who, were, who was alive to who in French and Franco. Yeah. Anyway, that whole colonial piece was certainly not part of the learning I had as the limited learning 
but it's been really in interesting to see that as a fresh looker, you know, I, I just sort of came to this, that was part of the narrative, right, accessible to me as sort of somebody who was just reading the history casually, to sort of think, oh, this is really different, and this shaped a different relationship about inter interrelationships. Yeah. Um, the French didn't need to have huge numbers of people um, in this vast territory that was, um, maybe we can go back, that was North America. Um, they, were out, they were outposts. Um, you know, there were 10,000 people um, in New Orleans, for instance, whereas there were a million people. There were, there were uh, in the different cities in the in English colonies that were, um, where there were far more established communities far more populous. Um, these posts um, weren't populated because I guess that according to the historical record, they, they weren't needed um, in order to, um, to satisfy the strategic and also the economic needs. There was the fur trade at the time. There were fishing industries in, these, in various places in the Atlantic world. And so in order to supply communities and also to supply a growing demand in Europe for pelts, beaver pelts and fish. They, did, they, they, they only needed these small posts of, of men. However, these communities did need to be reinforced, particularly at times when of, in periods of war. And so women sometimes were sent. Maybe historically you've heard about the, the women of the king, les filles du roi. These were often Parisian widows, young and, and older women who were sent to join those, those soldiers and those expeditioners and to create families, hopefully large families. Legally, they had to create large families. They had to marry by 16 for boys and 20 by, for men and start populating New France and, and reinforce these, these posts that were, again, strategic and also much, much smaller for all sorts of reasons, not wanting to depopulate Europe, not necessarily needing, not, not having the kinds of cities that were developing in, in the English colonies. Um, but the, 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 it's interesting to see the way that the English and the French defined empire and defined a continent and experienced it very differently historically. And um, I, I think it's an interesting way to, to go back and look at American history and, and to see French involvement and sometimes French counter sort of movements in terms of the overall historical trajectory. And um, it's been fun for me to just to, to learn more um, about that, that, that French history of the US. I was, I, was, I, was, I was going to read a part of the book that talked a little bit about that. Um, I, I, um, but I, I don't think we have time. Yep. Um, when I do genealogy research, I try to find out about people's names. And the 1600s in Quebec are easy to read about because it's pioneers and there's lots of books. But the 1700s is easy to read about kind of wars, but there's lots of books. The 1900s and 2000s is easy to find. But the 1800s is very hard to find social history of Quebec. You don't know what the people were doing or what their lives were like. But is there a fiction or a non-fiction book that I've never been about that middle century? There must be. I <laughs> About I Quebec. The problem is their lives became so simple, it regressed to agriculture. And, and a regression of, of life means a regression of culture. And, and they went from being very literate society in the 1700s to being non literate in the 1800s. Yeah. Um, by 1800, most of the population was born on the North American continent. Yes. And so you've got, and this is when people began identifying at the time as Canadian, Canadians, which had come from the Native American population. Um, there, there are a couple of historians that have done a lot of work on that, and I, I think you'd find some, I don't know if you'd learn much about daily life necessarily, but so much has been done in, in Quebec, I would imagine that. But they had to, the, these people had to move out of the cities too. A lot of them left because the British wouldn't allow them to buy land anywhere near the cities. They went to the farmlands and these uh, smaller places. And yeah. And well, that's why people came to mill towns and also. that's why they ended up here. But you, you don't know what their life was like there. Yeah. It was a century of blankness. 
Yeah. I can just think of a couple of examples that are taken from the, the body of, of literature that I w I've been reading on sort of the Franco-American experience here. And, and they talk about leaving farms and, and all of a sudden feeling like fish out of water in mill towns and sometimes returning, sometimes um, taking up gardening here or, or continuing to, to farm. The, the, what's interesting for me um, is that um, these were mostly rural peasant populations moving. And so many of the traditions that are, that are continued today are still sort of rural or, or peasant in nature, the foods, the music. Um, it's what my, my wife is French Canadian. And when she goes to some of the meetings, she, she's, they've been trying to recruit her for years in, in Chicopee, the, the, the women's, uh, the, the, the Dame Franco-Americaine, the, the Franco-American Women's Association. But people speak today, people who, French Canadians who've been in the US since the 60s, so not, not exactly the same period, but speak with the same rural French um, accent that's spoken in the uh, Beauce region. It's the, the Beauce region is the region of Quebec, sort of south of Quebec City. That's, where a part, that's a place where many people, villages, would sometimes come through word of mouth. Family members had heard that life was good, people had jobs, women could work. Women were sometimes recruited um, because they had smaller hands to work in the mills. They could, they could work the, uh, the looms, sometimes a little easier than, than men. Children began working sometimes as well. Um, but I would imagine that there's some fictive accounts and certainly some historical accounts of that important period where people were, were really beginning to identify with this Canadian continent that they had been born on. So mostly it would be academic sources, more than popular sources? They're, they're popular. There are lots of popular writers that write about some of this, but it's mostly the, you know, there was a growing urban movement as people were moving to the cities. They, they came here, but then Montreal experienced uh, an, econo an economic boom, and, and people started moving more into the cities as well. So I think you do have novels about that experience, but about life in the countryside. There's, of course, um, oh, the famous novel um, written in 1914, so that would be about the period late, Late 1900s, um, oh shoot, um, there was a movie written about it, or a movie, a movie done about this. It's a Frenchman who was just enamored of life, enamored with life in, in, in the former New France and wrote a novel called Man, um, oh, Maria Chapdelaine, has anyone? And so it's a novel about rural life in Quebec that, that might be interesting for you. It's been translated, Maria Chapdelaine. You can the Chapdelaine furniture in South Hadley. So spelled like this. Chapdelaine. Yep. Um, and that that convey. It's very. For, again, the, the critics argue. It, is it stereotypical? Is it authentic? This is by a Frenchman. Ri he's written what's now considered um, a part of the the Quebecois classic literature. It's part of the classic literary canon of Quebec. This, this Frenchman who very, spent very little time in Quebec because he died at a very, little, very early age, but this novel is still used, still read as conveying something about the French countryside. Um, French you know, the French Canadian countryside. The people of Quebec were extremely rich until they were conquered by the British. And, and their life degraded to the point that my great grandmother hmm. finished first grade in the middle of second grade. Hmm. And, and that, that's an incredible difference. She couldn't, she couldn't read or write French. <laughs> and how can you look from there to the side? So it just is great, especially in the very rural side. Yeah. The oral tradition is really intriguing. Stories that are told. Um, one of the things that I've, I discovered, even in these groups that meet every Thursday in Chicopee, it's a, in a reenactment of the French veillé. The French gathering to hear music, to tell stories, to be together, to be in community, to cre create community, um, and so people were, were ga people gathered and and told these stories from the oral tradition. They're things that haven't been written, but that you hear that are that are told from mother to, to daughter, from granddaughter to from from grandmother to granddaughter 
from, from granddaughter and mother to granddaughter, <laughs> sorry. Um, and from, you know, same, long, same thing along the paternal line. Um, but there's a, an important oral history um, that people are trying to preserve in Louisiana, but is there something that's lost in that writing down of what are largely peasant, working class, oral traditions? If, if scholars are rewriting them or translating them, that are they changing them fundamentally or, you know, and so, but the, in some cases, it, we're happy to have some things because the record, we, we, there've been recordings um, of music Recordings of storytelling in Louisiana that, and if you go to the archives in, at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, you can, have, you can listen to some of them in the original. You can hear storytellers who've agreed to, to, to be recorded and tell, their, tell stories that they heard their parents and grandparents tell in French. Sometimes the storytellers tell them in English now, um, sometimes in French but that those recordings were sometimes made in the 30s and the 40s, and so you know, the, the next generations are, are now telling some of those stories in English. But they're being changed, and maybe they're adding to those traditions. People are calling them new old traditions, and there's a real effort to take the old classics and remake them so that newer generations are interested. So they want to learn about their French heritage, and so they want <coughs> to, to learn some French and want to tell something to their children. And so um, this, this effort to rework the old classics and reinvent, it, it, it's interesting, disturbing for some. Some of the old masters refuse to be recorded. The musicians, there's a whole history of, of poetry in Louisiana that's fascinating. Again, working class folks who do something professionally but also through verse convey, through poetry, through music, convey something of their experience, something of their hardship. It's really compelling. It's really beautiful. Can we translate it? Can we capture some of it for, for, the, for future generations? Are we changing it? Are we perverting it? That's a big question. I know we need to end, but I'm curious yeah. whether you've been doing any oral history recording. We, we were talking about that at some point. It, we, we've got to talk to people before some of this history, there, are, there was a radio station in Northampton. Maybe you, some of you listened to it in the 80s and 90s. It was, I think it was WFCR. And there were people that recorded histories with French speakers. And you can still go on to some archive and listen to those stories. It's harder to find French speakers in Northampton and East Hampton and Chicopee now. So do we have to get together and talk with them? Do we have to tell their stories? Do, they have to, do we have to encourage them to come to Holyoke and, so we can learn about their stories in French or English or both? Um, yeah. I, I think it's, it's their efforts that are being done in Maine through the, the Franco-American Center to hear people's stories. There's a woman who's, who's actively writing and recording their stories um, who does work out of her. She's got a website called the Franco-American Women's Institute. And she's been really important in, in telling and recording and transmitting some of these stories. Um, but I, I think it is important. Um, kids should learn uh, about you know, their grandparents. <coughs> at, at, at the Franco-American Women's Association, at every May meeting, when they induct new members, they invite the kids and grandkids and, and nephews and nieces to come. Um, the group organizes scholarships for them, traditionally for, kids, for people who are continuing in French. You got one? Oh, wow. Yeah. They've given out, over the generations, they've given out thousands yeah. of dollars. And they feel great about that. They've mm -hmm. given money to the St. George's School. Mm -hmm. um, they're, promo they're promoting Franco-American cultures, mm -hmm. and as you define them. And, um, are they the only group in the area that you're aware of that's doing anything? There's, there are other groups getting together. They're the only formal group that I know that I've met with that's gathered. I do know that the Lowell group is, is another. I don't know of any other here. Mm. Uh, although I, there are lots of Franco-Americans in East Hampton. East Hampton, East Hampton could do something very similar. If, but there, there may be a French table now going on at the, the new bagel shop. These things, these things sort of spring up and no one knows about them except the people participating. And then through word of mouth, they create a, they create a, um, 
what's the, the term, uh, a, a network and the, what's the word, the, the um, where for group, groups meet, a meetup or something, yeah. a, a meetup. Yeah. They, so all of these groups use this, this one sort of tool, I guess, to meet up and talk about all kinds of things. And that's how the French group meets in, in they meet at um, the Fiorentina Cafe in, Nor in, Nor in Northampton. Oh. Um, yeah, there's a group that meets there the every Italian other. One, not the French one. The, the Italian one, yeah. <laughs> but maybe they'll start meeting at the new French cafe. Um, but then there's there's the, there's a still there's still a French group meeting at the Moroccan restaurant every Thursday night in Northampton. They get together and speak French. And I, w I went when I first started working. I went pretty often, and met with different groups of people who wanted to speak French. And it's still going. Um, that last I heard. Um, they meet at um, this uh, Saint L Saint Lima, Saint Rose, uh, Saint Rose de, Li de Lima Church. Um, on yeah, in the church downstairs. In the the meeting space um, downstairs. That's where they've been meeting since uh, Nativity Church was sold, um, and now they're officially associated with the, the church in, in Aldenville. Um, for religious, I'm sorry, for insurance purposes, they had to be tied. They were hoping some of the parishioners would become members and it would boost numbers, but last I heard it, it hadn't. Um, I wish you'd read one paragraph from your book, this paragraph. Can I, you do that? Sure. <laughs> your voice is so good for reading. <laughs> did you bring any books to sell us? I did. I, I don't know how I would do it, though, because they're, they're, they're my copies. Oh. I, I guess I could... I, I, you want me to? Okay, <laughs> sure. Um, this is from page. This is on page two eighty seven from the conclusion. Franco Americans of New England, as well as the U.S. government, offer tribute to neighboring Quebec in a twenty first century monument erected along the banks of the Saint Lawrence River, just south of Quebec City, where the French began their colonial experiment in the New World. It stands as a tribute to the French Canadian populations and cultures that traveled south and established themselves permanently in the United States. It also marks their symbolic return to their, incest, to their ancestral Canada, a return that would not be realized by many French Canadian immigrants while living. Francos of North, of North America still remember from whence they came, je me souviens. You know, this is on the license plates of mm -hmm. Quebec automobiles. Insisting that the descendants of immigrants have not forgotten their roots or the routes that they have taken, the Franco-American monument transcribes the topographic and imaginary space where France and America converge. Its existence is an acknowledgment of transnational French and Francophone cultures. The fleeting nature of life, Francophone and otherwise, renders memory in all of its manifestations profoundly meaningful. Mm. Oh. <laughs> good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was a good choice. <laughs> Um, so I'd, I, I continue to be, to, to work on, on Franco-American cultures. Um, I've been working on um, Franco-American baseball and assimilation. <laughs> and um, because it struck me in, in all of these documents that I was seeing, this, the national pastime, the French were involved. I, I, and I had no idea that French was such a popular sport among the French of, of New England, of, of, of North America. And so that's what I've been studying a little bit here in, in, in uh, Holyoke and other places. And I, I'm not working on a book about Frank American baseball, but it's, it's, part, it's just a small project. And, but I, I continue to work on, on, on living Frank, Franco-American cultures. And, and, and I think I want to continue talking with students about these living French cultures that they can see, that they can hear. Um, the last time we went to Chicopee was 2015 with a group. And again, we had a spontaneous French veillé, a French, I don't know how to translate that, a French evening soiree. Yeah. yeah. People pl on the accordion, people started playing music. We had these French foods, we had French meat pie. Um, we, we sang and spoke and told stories, and it was amazing for the students to experience this. And um, for, for, I, 
for, for people who are getting older, sometimes it, it might not be as easy to organize that kind of thing, you know, in another 10 years. I, I hope, I hope younger people will take, you know, take the baton and, and continue to do things. So I, I, I want to continue to, to talk and to teach. It, it's fun to, to not only work on stuff, but to be able to talk about it in class. And, and it, it make it, I think local history is such, so important for making our experiences here real and for these students who are sometimes only in Northampton for four years to really connect them to, to the place. Um, it's, it's, it's good and, and in lots of different departments and disciplines people are doing local histories and really involving students hopefully bringing them to the library. We, we came here in 2015 mm -hmm. with a group and I haven't taught that class since then but it was, the, it was for them to discover there was a French language newspaper here. They couldn't believe it. They had no idea that there was this French history, that there was an Alliance Francaise in Northampton um, that was active um, and promoting culture. So, too, anyway. the elite third row connected to Asteria the Skinner's Mill, and the, the daughter of the original owner of the Skinner's Mill, he, she had an apartment in Paris. And this is all about her conception of the French ambassador to the Oh, yeah. I mean, so the elite She restored oil. a village in France after the yes. war. Right. And so, you know, there was this elite Protestants in Hoyo who cultivated French and so on. And um, it just seems to me like tying these pieces together, you know, we, we talked about the working class French Canadians who worked in that mill, the Skinner, so one of those largely French Canadian employees. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and she's at the top, or her, her, her brother was running it. But, you know, um, that's why I, growing up in Hoyo, I went to public school, but I, I started learning French in sixth grade hmm. because at that time, which was when I was in sixth grade, it was like 1955, 56, French was promoted uh, probably because of World War II. Well, it was but the international language, language until so English. On. But it had a cachet among yeah. Irish Americans who went to the school, yeah. public school system of, of, of importance, you know, like uh, Senator Kennedy's mother, Rose, was You know, the Irish elite always kind of cultivated the French connection. Yeah. So it just, uh, uh, at least in, in Ireland. It just, uh, so I mean, that kind of chapter gets overlooked. Yeah. So, I don't know, as I say, it's all kind of like, it's like oil. You know, I feel lucky that I learned French. We are surviving as a French department in part because of the cachet of French now in Asia. French culture and language um, still carries lots of heft. And so um, sometimes a third of our classes are, are, are with students of Asian descent from Korea and China and Vietnam to other places. Um, and in some departments, in other departments, it's the same. Um, but for, for growing middle class and upper middle class, people who are, for, for this growing industrial class in China, growing richer, um, French culture is a sign of their ascendance. They're sending their kids to US institutions. French is very acceptable sometimes. They can't always major in French, but they can take French classes. Um, and, and so we're, we're very thankful <laughs> that, they're, that they're in our classes because you know, la languages sometimes, are, the interest in language isn't encouraged or isn't promoted. And we're, we're sometimes struggling to, to, to keep our, our departments going. Public schools cutting out foreign languages yeah. in the lower grades. There's not going to be as much demand at the college level. There's only French and Spanish at the high school level. Often now, there, there are fewer. When I started, there were many more languages at our local high school, and it's a, in a pretty good high school. Schools are under lots of constraints and tightening there's, budgets and there's none language. In Holyoke until no. You get to high school. Wow. That's it. Wow. In the Prime time for learning languages when you're really young. Yeah, the good the good news is you you, you can always continue to come back to it and learn. We know that it, it is easier for adults to learn language, but I'm sorry for children to learn languages. But adults are more are better learners. They know how to learn. Our brains aren't as well, soft and spongy. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> but we 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 can adults can do a lot of good things in language. We can make lots of progress. Mm. So it's not, it's never too late. Um, and that's, that's a good thing, yeah. I think. I have a question for Eileen. 
copies of La Justice in the history room? Yes. Oh. So we we have a newspaper. Uh, awesome. Not the full one. I think ours goes up to the forties. Um, but it's a, it's almost forty years. Um, and some microphone. Yeah. There 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 are holes yeah, here and there. Steps. Yeah. Does Smith have the full set? I don't believe we have any. Any so set at all of <laughs> that's why I've, I've, yeah, <laughs> um, the Boston Public Library has has all of them. I don't know how complete. So it, you can get them online then if they have to Boston. No. But you you have to go to Boston. They have, they have, they have made them. Yeah. They're not digitized. Well, digitized and internet accepted. You know, well, it depends what you consider. I guess microfilm microfilm wasn't digitized. L last I was. Lots of, municipal, municipal, lots of municipal libraries have copies of different papers. Um, in the Boston Public, Public Library, they have, a, they have lots, of, lots of things that you can't get anywhere else, but I, I think you have to physically go there for, for many. I, yeah. So it, in some cases, you may be able to find something that's a little closer. But yeah. So. Did you ever visit Precious Blood uh, Cemetery? I've just seen the picture so far oh, okay. that you gave me. Um, I haven't gone, I haven't, I tried, you know, Father Lafleur, la, one of the last French-speaking priests, he was supposed to take me there. And, and then he, he passed away. Oh, and we were going to do it, we were going to take a little trip and, and visit the, the f a huge French cemetery in South Hadley. And, and, and um, I'm sorry that I, I was away working on it with a study abroad program. And so I, I never got to visit. And oh, you have to do it. Put the GPS to Precious Blood Cemetery. Once Precious you're in the cemetery, it's obvious where the monument is. It's the biggest thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's, it's huge. <laughs> you, you told me about it and I, in 2015, and I still haven't gotten there. Yeah. Well, so. they, they did such a wonderful job, so, you know. Yeah. Okay. I will go. <laughs> yeah. I, I, will, I would like to see it in, in the flesh. I hope turn out does not discourage you because I no. it so fast. This is, this is great. <laughs> Another. Yeah, I'd, thank hours. you for staying for two hours. My gosh. I, It'd be nice to know the stories of each person here and why they came here and their own personal background. The, the individual story. stories are fascinating. Um, yeah, I, I, your background, are you part Caribbean or something? On my mom's side, this is what I, this is all rumor. I, we, we've got some French speakers somewhere. I've never seen them or met them. Um, so I, I've, I've grown up learning French and just becoming interested. That, that cachet of French sort of attracted me. And then all of a sudden I'm in Quebec and I've got French cultures that are close by. And yet, as a kid, I, I couldn't understand why do these French cultures not carry the same cachet as Parisian cultures? Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I was very aware of that. And so it, it's been interesting as, adult, as an adult to come back and, and study more about it. So.